We're going to take a look now at the epistle Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. This is page 955 in your pew Bibles. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly. And their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, if this is your first Sunday with us in a while here at Central, if you're worshiping with us online for your first time, we are in the midst of a sermon series on the seven deadly sins. And um, we're looking at these capital vices through the lens of sanctification, that process by which we become more and more like Jesus, our Savior. And as Christians, we live with an openness, an openness to the spirits wooing us, nudging us, conforming us more and more into the character and likeness of Jesus himself. And we are reformed. So as reformed Christians, we talk about sin, and that's okay. And when we talk about sin, we become more and more aware of our need of forgiveness. And both should lead us to this place of accepting God's grace, this gift of grace, of love, of acceptance, all of which leads us closer and closer to healing. As I said uh, last week, John Calvin understood all sin to be rebellion against God's law and deserving of eternal punishment. But there's hope. For sin that's committed by Christians, well, maybe mortal sin and deserving of eternal punishment, it's also venial that is pardonable in the sense that it's covered by the merits of Christ. There, that, that way, those who've come to faith will never lose their justification. And as we've already mentioned, graced disciplines are the bridge between the awareness of sin and the beginning of the sanctification journey. And I read a book not too long ago by Diana Butler Bass called The Practicing Congregation, and, and she surveyed thousands of churches. And the churches that were growing the common denominator between those churches was that the spiritual leaders in the church were actually the ones practicing the disciplines. They were engaged in fasting and study and meditation. So there was a, there was a connection between the leadership modeling these virtues to the congregation and that produced spiritual depth and growth in number, in worship attendance and in membership. And I'm going to come back to the imitate our leaders in just a moment. We've covered two vices already, vainglory and envy. And I wonder, and and this this is a question that Tom Rowe asked the men on Thursday at noon. He he just asked the guys, he said, okay, we talked about vainglory and we talked about what the virtues are uh, to, you know, combating our, our need for attention and to be admired in the wrong ways and, and for the wrong reasons. And so he just said, guys, who of you have practiced silence and solitude? Who actually did that this week? And we were honest. Most of us hadn't. And most of us find it challenging to not want to talk about ourselves. We've, we also talked a little bit about envy. Envy's wicked eye shrinks the view of the good, but a heart of gratitude enlarges it. We're not doing a sermon series on the seven deadly sins to make you feel horrible about yourself. This isn't a guilt trip. This isn't a recipe for despair. What God asks of us first is that we be human, not God. What God wants us to know is that we're loved beyond measure 
always. This is an invitation to be set free. Now, I say that because I was reading Neil Plantiga's book earlier this week, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, and he notes how Scripture reveals the real human predicament. He says, not, he says that inexplicably, irrationally, we all keep living our lives against what's good for us. And what can only be called the mystery of inequity, human beings from nearly the beginning have done so, often chosen to live against God, against each other, and against God's world. We live even against ourselves. So he says an addict, for example, partakes of a substance or practice that he knows might kill him. And for a time, he does so freely. He has a choice. He freely starts a conversion unto death. And for reasons he can't fully explain, he doesn't stop until he crashes. He starts out with a choice. He ends up with a habit. And the habit slowly converts to a kind of slavery that can be broken only by God, or as they say in the 12-step literature, a higher power. These are vices. They're habits. They're habits that bring us to destruction, what the apostle calls to the end. They destroy us. They remove us from each other, and they remove us from our creator. And this brings us to the third vice, gluttony. Um, And gluttony is a subject that comedians love to talk about because they make millions and millions of dollars poking fun at overweight people. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. I I don't know a lot of comedians that are making fun of people who are anorexic, which is a horrible disease and sickness. But gluttony, a habit that is both oversimplified and misunderstood, is something most of us have encountered in our lives. I was reading an article by Father David McConey, fabulous writer, um, a Catholic priest. He says, gluttony is not simply eating too much, guys. It's, it's also eating at an imp- inopportune or improper time. It's eating too eagerly. It's eating too expensively. It's even eating too daintily. As the sylph-like supermodel is just as consumed by disordered concerns about calories as the corpulent gourmand. There's a classic scene from Babette's Feast, one of the great um, uh, food porn movies of all time. It shows a group of austere Danish pietists having nightmares at the, at the devilish prospect of eating a fine dinner prepared for them by their French cook. And they resolve their moral dilemma. This is just so funny. They resolve it by promising that when they eat, it'll be as if none of them have any taste. Thomas Aquinas, a hefty fellow himself, much like Martin Luther, declared that gluttony has six daughters. Excessive and unseemly joy are the first two daughters, followed by loudishness, uncleanness, talkativeness, and an uncomprehending dullness of mind. Others have even claimed that gluttony paves the way to lechery, that is, lustfulness. Now, it is not lost on me that as I preach this sermon to you from this pulpit, Tim Jose is downstairs in the kitchen preparing our pancake breakfast. And we will enjoy every bite of those pancakes. It's also not lost on me that when it comes to gluttony, it seems to be inextricably linked to just about everything that we think, say, and do. And it's also not lost on me that in our uniquely self-indulgent age from binge-watching Netflix shows to never knowing when enough is enough of anything, we spend countless dollars Encouraging abstinence and self-control in this one area of indulgence. So hear me for a moment. 
According to Frances Prose in her book, Gluttony, one-third of all Americans, 63 million, are overweight. 15% of American children are overweight. 250,000 deaths a year are attributable to poor diet and inactivity. 50% of cardiovascular disease is related to excess weight. We spend as much as 50 billion a year dieting. Laparoscopic gastric bypass surgery has become the new status surgery for the rich, more chic than a facelift. That 50 billion for diets is more than we spend on education, training, employment, and social services. And check this out. We spend more on dieting in the United States than the gross national product of Ireland. So think about the commercials that you see on television, the ones that pop up on your YouTube feed, or those magazines at Forest Hills Foods or at Meijer. You know the ones, hey, in six weeks, you can look like this. Or the Atkins diet. Some of you might have tried that. You know what I'm talking about. What is it that you will buy so that you can reach the goal that you have in your mind that you need to reach? But gluttony has something to do with eating and drinking. Yes, but this vice, according to Dr. Rebecca DeYoung, gluts on pleasure, reducing human life to self-gratification. I'm going to say that again. Gluttony gluts on pleasure, reducing human life to self-gratification. It's not necessarily how much we're eating, but about how much pleasure we take in eating and why. So Tom, Thomas Aquinas, the big guy, he put it this way, gluttony primarily and intrinsically signifies the intemperate desire to consume food, not the intemperate consumption of food. It is a case of gluttony only when we knowingly exceed the measure in eating from a desire for pleasure of the palate. So, essentially, gluttony reduces us to being self-satisfaction seekers. And Dr. DeYoung asks, well, how can we tell that we've turned pleasure into an idol? She says, well, our desire for pleasure can grow so obsessive and all-consuming that we may disregard the real needs of both body and soul to the point of eating ourselves to death. In the novel, Zorba the Greek, Alexis Zorba asks his young friend, the boss, hey, tell me what you do with the food that you eat and I'll tell you who you are. He says, some turn their food into fat and manure, some into work and good humor, and others, I'm told, into God. So the Apostle Paul, to the Christians living in Philippi, said, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've often told you of them, and now I even tell you with, uh, with, with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Now, this is really important, because nothing's changed in 2,000 years. This, is, this, is, this might as well have been written for us at Central Reformed Church in the year 2021. And the Greek word the apostle uses here for belly is koilia, and it can mean the whole belly, the entire like, cavity, all of it, the womb even, the innermost part of a human, their soul, their heart as the seat of thought, of discerning, feeling, choice. Koilia is a feminine noun that comes from the root word koilas, which means hollow. And it's interesting that in the Greek New Testament, koilia is used 23 times, 11 as belly and 12 times as womb or wombs. And so I was thinking about this word koilia, all kinds of thoughts danced across my mind. 
And the word brought to mind all the empty spaces in people's lives. For example, anxiety, uh, fear, loneliness, rejection, despair, self-doubt. There are many uh, kinds of neediness and brokenness that create hollow spots in the soul. Some echo things that happened to us long ago. Maybe, maybe when we were a little girl or a little boy, something horrible happened to us and it's created this emptiness. And so it's not all that uncommon for our lives to be driven by attempts to fill our heart's empty spots, right? This happens consciously and unconsciously. And I think if we understand this a little bit better, it may help us be a little bit more compassionate towards those who display openly bad behavior. And so the belly, the apostle speaks of, could be a metaphor for self-indulgence and worldly desires of a more general sort. Many of the more modern translations use appetite instead of stomach or belly. In fact, John Wesley, in his journals, thought the apostle was referring to those whose supreme happiness lies in gratifying their sensual appetites. An appetite for beauty, comfort, approval, status, possessions, wealth, art, knowledge, power, sex, entertainment, sports, hobbies, drugs, fine wine, cheap beer, any of those things that can control a person's life. Any appetite, even for something good, can become a god. So whether the apostle considered the belly as the source of ignoble passions as the Greeks did, he appears to be in an argument with himself or a debate with himself about Jewish food laws. Should new Christians, many of whom are Jewish, eat kosher or not? Right? Should they have two refrigerators and just one? For the faithful Jew, every meal is a religious occasion, an event that begins with a blessing, acknowledging food as a gift from God. Therefore, to abuse food is to abuse one of God's good gifts. Such abuse, the apostle believed, will lead to a bitter end, to the end, to destruction. In fact, in Romans chapter 16, he warns Christians living in Rome to avoid certain people causing dissension. For such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. In other words, these are folks who are serving their bellies. And the belly that's served only leads to one place, to an end. As the Proverbs say, there is a way in which seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. Rebecca DeYoung in Glittering Vices, she says, Gluttony's excessive pursuit of the pleasures of the table eventually dulls our appreciation for the food we eat, the pleasure we take in eating it. Those with whom we eat and the God who created what we eat and gave us the ability to take pleasure in it. Food and pleasure are goods, not God's. Indeed, I would argue, based on what she just said, there's so much more to life than gluttony's pursuit for unbridled hedonism. And so in order to combat gluttony, she offers the discipline of fasting. I know that's everybody's favorite discipline. It's hard, isn't it? Especially at New Year's when, that's it, I'm not eating chocolate for 365 days, but by day 13, we're right back to Godiva chocolates. It happens to the best of us. But if it's done well, and it's done with accountability, 
and it's intentional, Dr. DeYoung says fasting accomplishes two amazing things. She says by giving up certain foods for a time and, not, and by not eating to satiety, we learn to let go of pleasure as an idol we get to control and to receive it instead as a gift. This discipline heightens our appreciation for material goods while also keeping this appreciation in its place with room for the enjoyment of both simple bodily pleasures and spiritual goods. So now back to imitating the leaders, following the leaders. You know, this is where consistory comes in and where the spiritual leaders of Central come to play and elders, deacons, great consistory. If you're a great consistory elder or deacon, think about how you live to model the disciplines to the congregation, to the larger community. The Apostle Paul understood the importance of example. That's why he said to the Christians in Philippi, join in imitating me. Watch me. Study me. Do as I do. In fact, in Philippians chapter 4, the next chapter, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He not only verbally instructed the believers in the way of Christ, but he personally modeled this Christ-likeness to them as he lived out his faith before them, always. And this is what we're doing at Central. This is what the elders and the deacons have committed to. We have new journey discipleship groups. We had one start this morning. We're off and running. We do this so that we will become more and more like our Savior and grow in him and, and know our place in him. And the apostle knew that human beings do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He taught them they can't afford to approach the, the table with gratification in mind. Rather, Christians go to the table with gratitude for all that God has done, is doing, and will do for our benefit. They go to the table with gratitude, with a deep desire for loving union with the Creator. Not, what's in it for me, Jesus? But thank you, for what you've already done and are doing in my life. And so we imitate the Apostle Paul. We imitate him because he followed Christ. And he knew better than anyone that yes, we need bread to satisfy our physical needs, but only the bread of life will satisfy all of our spiritual needs. Otherwise, we're not satisfied. We just want more and more and more and more and more and we can't stop because we don't know that this only leads to the end for us. An emptiness, a hunger for more. But in Christ, we're full, we're satisfied, we're complete and in him and only in him is it ever enough. Let's pray. Our gracious God, thank you for your word is both true and can be trusted. And we ask that the words we've heard proclaimed from this pulpit on this day may through your grace be so grafted within our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruits of the Spirit. To the honor and praise of your most glorious name, through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say, 
Amen.